How's everybody doing tonight? This is Justin from the Generation Y, but don't be confused. You are listening to the Dialogue Podcast right now, and you're about to hear a replay episode of Rebecca and I's interview that was done back in uh, February of 2020 in the before time. Sadly, Rebecca is recovering from COVID, but she will be back next week with a new wonderful guest and interview. Check out this replay in the meantime. Hi, Justin. <laughs> Welcome to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. I'm very excited to talk with you. Yay. I'm excited to be here. I'm impressed you can even talk. You just mentioned you haven't had coffee, so... it's It's been a rough night. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of the night, uh, we got to meet briefly last night at the Forensic Files reboot premiere. Absolutely. Which was pretty fun. It was it was pretty cool. I've never been to anything like that before. So, really? Yeah. Well, you're, in my mind, kind of a true crime podcast OG, and that's like a very iconic OG show, so it makes sense to see you there. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where I want to start. I feel like you entered this landscape before it was an industry that we know today. So 2012, you're obviously one half of Generation Y, yeah. and I'd love to hear about what's going on in your head in 2012 where you're like, I'm going to talk about true crime cases in a microphone with my friend, and maybe people will listen, because that wasn't, it, it's not what it is now. No, no, it was, uh, in 2012, it was a completely different world. I think the only other true crime podcast in existence was True Murder, and yeah. it's a Canadian true crime podcast. Okay. It's an author. And uh, I got called for jury duty for a first degree murder trial in Kansas City. Interesting. And I was working in corporate America and they would pay for me to be on jury duty. So right. I was like, I'm not even going to try to get out of this. I'm no. just going to go. It's like a dream. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I'm, I'm all about experiencing new things in life. So yeah. I, I, I was called it, um, in and then uh, they bring all these people into the jury, the, the, the courtroom. And then I was juror number one in the jury box. And they swapped out three boxes, and I stayed. Oh, they liked you. Yeah. And uh, jury selection was, I think, on a Tuesday. Okay. And I found the guy guilty and put him away for life by Friday. Wow. And that's not how we perceive courts, uh, trials and stuff. Not I mean, at it's all. A, you know, people th say that the CSI effect. And it's like, oh, well, you get the forensics, you need to blah, blah, blah. But there's also the law and order effect. You right. think that it's this long, drawn-out process. And no, it was very to the point. And, and I wanted to tell the world about that. I wanted to tell the world. I just wanted to package up. This is reality. This is how the system works. And put it in a neat little gift back. Format, you know, yeah. And, and hand it out to the public. And uh, at the time, you know, I listened to, uh, I think, Snap Judgment and Joe Rogan. Or, okay. You know, yeah, it was yeah. the only podcast. But really you were right. an early adopter. I mean, yeah. I, I don't think I was listening to podcasts in 2012. Yeah. Um, so I told my friend Aaron, I said, hey, man, I got to tell the world about this. Like, yeah, I just want to tell, I just want to talk about it. And Aaron and I talk about everything. We were, we've been friends forever. Okay. And he's, he said, well, you know, I just watched this documentary called The Staircase, and oh. I want to talk about that. Yeah. I was like, well, my jury duty will be episode one, and The Staircase will be episode two. I'm like, well, just make a podcast. I don't know. We'll call it The Generation Y or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that was all that the more thought, because it was Generation Y, the question, right? and let's question society. That was all the more thought I put into it. <laughs> you know, it's a good lesson, and sometimes, like, it's just this confluence of timing idea luck talent passion interest yeah. um something i think i've said on this before is elizabeth gilbert the writer she doesn't say follow your passion she says follow your curiosity and it just seems like that's what you were doing yeah, yeah. so so you record and like how quickly does it catch on so you know in a few months time and we were not just doing true crime in the beginning we did everything okay we because we were questioning society right but questioning society you do question the legal system and things like that but uh but um all of our true crime related cases or episodes had their downloads skyrocketed yeah. and then if we talked about i don't know mma or something else no down right. no one cared right so we slowly just morphed more and more towards true crime 
not that we weren't true crime in the beginning, because I mean, I talked about jury duty and talked That's about how it started. Yeah. yeah, but we just really focused in on that, and I didn't put that much more thought into it. But it wasn't until True Murder uh, came on our show that we saw our first bump. Okay. And then Serial happened a couple years right, later. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, the fact that you predate Serial is so interesting because um, I think that's when podcasts got on the consciousness of most or of a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you're talking about the things I really like to talk about, which is you saw these spikes in numbers and downloads and engagement over true crime. So I'm all about asking people why they think that is. And there's no right or wrong answer, but what do you think this collective obsession is where does it come from or just for you uh for me i i will i guess that i i see it as you know people watch drama people watch soap operas people watch whatever but it's fictional mm -hmm. true crimes real mm -hmm. and it's the same crazy drama and intrigue and backstabbing and everything but it's true now uh in the true crime genre it's actually 80% female yep, and about 20% male. Yep. Uh, and I, I relate to that in a way that, uh, right. I think that's because women can empathize more, Yeah. but they can, abs this is my own theory, my own opinion. Sure. Um, guys, we watch survivor man or stuff like that. Like things that would threaten us and it's being out in the middle of the wild and nature and whatever. Uh -huh. Whereas, a woman can just be walking to her car in the parking lot and feel threatened. Yeah. So I think that's why the lopsidedness. You're not the first person to say that. There's a self-protection aspect of it. I think women um, are naturally empathetic, as you're saying. I think we're communicators, so we, we like story. But I think we're also listening, like seeing ourselves in that scenario seeing if we can learn something, remember something. Um, I interviewed an author. I don't know if you've heard of this book called Savage Appetites for, it, yeah. for women, for true stories of women, crime and obsession. And it's about a, like four prototypes of women that she thinks there are kind of these archetypes and where they fall in. Really interesting, like the defender, the victim, the investigator, and there's, um, and then the killer. Yeah. And that also she was putting forth, maybe women really like dark content but we're not allowed to in a weird way. And true crime gives us a vehicle to kind of explore the darker side of things, which I thought was really interesting and I hadn't heard before. I never thought, I mean, I think you're right that women aren't allowed because there's so many rules, double standards and whatnot. But uh, I think times have changed. And times have <laughs> changed. And even probably in the eight years since you started. Yeah. Oh, so it's a whole different world. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to talk about that. So you're two years in, Serial comes out, and then like I feel like the collective consciousness of true crime and what can happen when we all start thinking about one case. I mean, I feel like everybody knows about the case of Adnan Syed and yeah. Heyman Lee. So how does that then start affecting your work? The industry is growing. So you kind of have your position there. Do you have to adapt or do you just keep doing what you're doing? I, we kept doing what we were doing as far as content uh -huh. because that was just the, the groove we had found. Now, we definitely upgraded our microphones and things like that. Sure. Uh, because literally when we started, I was using a gaming headset <laughs> and we were talking on Skype. Okay. And just recording the call. Yeah. Because that was just my buddy and I talking about right. whatever we wanted. And that's... That's something I, I, I would like to tell people is if you have an idea, don't put the cart before the horse. Just do it. Yes. And then you can upgrade later. <laughs> right. It's about the progress, not perfection. I don't think most of us yeah. would start something if we figured it all out yeah. in advance. But we, we kept the, the same format and everything. Uh, it's, uh, we try to keep it very conversational as much as possible. Uh, but we definitely have you know, researchers now and what? people yeah. to help us fact check and right. whatnot. Whereas before it was just Aaron and I all on you. Yeah. I still do all the editing. You do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I do most of the post-production. Um, but yeah, most of the research and stuff now, cause that's really time consuming. That's where the time is. We, we hire people for that now. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Um, so talk about your process and how do you kind of keep it fresh all these years? I know that's a weird question. It is a working relationship and you have a, a sort of structure to your show that I think is what people love about it so much. The conversational aspect, what's unique in the conversation is that it's, it never feels um, 
I don't know what the word is, but it's it's moving forward all the time. There's not a lot of um, like unnecessary chatter. That's one of my pet peeves <laughs> is uh, if I go in to listen to a podcast and the episode is about, I don't know, 9-11 attacks or something. Mm-hmm. If you don't get to the point in the first five minutes, yeah. I'm probably turning it off. Now, if it's a comedy podcast, I get it. There's You can leave room for yeah, that. Yeah, there, there's banter and whatnot. But yeah. if, if you're just a regular podcast about discussing something, I am so to the point. Yeah. And uh, it's even funny now because we're supposed to banter a little bit at the beginning right. and then put in a pre-roll like, uh-huh. and then start the episode. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> even that's like... Yeah. So... Aaron is more the storyteller and I'm more of the conversationalist and he will keep us on point and I will just add in all of my thoughts, all my details, everything that I found. Uh, And I don't know, I just, I guess it's learning how to play the guitar and sing at the same time. Yeah, that's a great (laughs) analogy. So how much is scripted? Because that's the other thing is it feels super conversational, like you're not reading, and yet there's this really nice flow that I think is hard to find between two co-hosts sometimes. We've never been scripted. Okay, so the back and forth truly is you guys just talking. Yeah. And you have your own talking points and sort of your own summaries and you're exactly. exchanging ideas. And now now we kind of have the same talking points and summaries that we're both going off of. Right. But I still have to do my own research because somebody can, you know, reword a, a Wikipedia article or something mm-hmm. like that. Somebody can just take the general overview of a case. But what's the hook? Yeah. And That's what I'm always trying to look for is why is this case more interesting than the last? Exactly. And I think you guys make a point to talk about both sides of the story. And I've definitely listened to cases where I've had my mind made up about it. And I've listened to yours and been like, oh, shoot, like I might have to reconsider, which is something I really appreciate, even though sometimes it's uncomfy, as my Mm -hmm. kids say, (laughs) that makes me uncomfy. Um, But I think you guys do that. You're like, well, here's here's where we understand and see the prosecution's theory and what they're putting out. And here's where this has holes. And you break that down. Um, A lot of podcasts come in pretty strong on one side or another. I try not to, uh, because as much as I am passionate about the genre and true crime, I don't have a dog in the race. Okay. if Adnan or Stephen Avery did it or didn't do it. Right. It, my opinion does not matter. So I try to just look at it unbiasedly. And I try to be unbiased with my opinion. Now we're human. So I'm always going to fall on one side or another. But yeah. I absolutely try to give both sides. So it's interesting, though, because some would say it, while it might not affect change legally, it kind of does matter because there is so much advocacy work coming around wrongful convictions and such. So what do you think about that? And sort of do you see that in true crime, this movement? And, and what do you think about it? Yeah, I, I guess it does matter in the sense that it brings awareness and yeah. puts it back in the public's attention. Uh, and that's all the more credit I will give myself or my podcast <laughs> is just it's raising awareness. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will never say like, oh, we solved the crime or anything like that. Right. Because um, and, and, and again, I, I think that I can w- raise awareness for a podcast all I want or a case with my podcast. And let's say that that guy got a new trial. Well, then it's what happens in trial mm-hmm. that really matters. And they might not be exonerated. They might be exonerated. So again, I, I don't like taking credit for anything that happens in the real world on my podcast. That's reasonable. <laughs> it, and it's not that I want to give myself a pass for any wrongdoings. It's I, I never would feel arrogant enough to say, oh, I, I had some sort of influence on this outcome. No, that makes total sense to me. Um, let's go back to the jury duty because something that's come up in a lot of my conversations is is a trial by jury. And the more I talk to people, the more in awe of our system I am, for better and for worse. It depends on the day, but oh, yeah. it scares me to think about uh, a unanimous decision by 12 of my peers. And when I really think about reasonable doubt and when I've explored and learned more about it, I think it's amazing to me we get convictions at the rate we do. And, and maybe we don't. I know a lot of things plea out before they even go to trial. But what was your experience on the jury with that responsibility and what did finding reasonable doubt or, or deciding you you convicted your jury convicted so what did that look like 
so it was a, a crack dealer or a cocaine dealer selling to a crack cook. So he would make crack out of the cocaine. Okay. And as, it was obvious he was the perpetrator like because they had a, a deal. Well, they had a previous relationship. Okay. They had dealings and all this stuff. And then there were other people that were there. And the crack cook lived, but his girlfriend died. Okay. So the crack cook was like, that's the dude that killed my girlfriend. Okay. And so it was no doubt in my mind. Like, why would he just pick this guy randomly? Okay. There was not a single shred of DNA evidence, not a single fingerprint found at the house. And yet. Do you need that? I prefer it. <laughs> it's that, possible. That, yeah, and that's that's I mean, of... no, you don't. I there are cases Yeah. I mean, it's it's when, you know, if if a a family member of yours was shot and killed and you lived through the attack and said, "That's the person that did it." Mm-hmm. And we have a long relationship with them. Mm-hmm. It's not some random person misidentification whatever. Yeah. So, and in my jury, I would I would call them the alphas and the betas, and it doesn't okay. has nothing to do with male or female. Sure, sure. Uh, but there were three alphas, and I was one of them, and we drove that jury, and everybody else was just along for the ride because they didn't want to be there. They had just no interest. This is what I'm talking about. I yeah. mean, I would pick a bench trial if it was ever my life on the line. I probably would too. No doubt. I mean, I just have more faith in one judge. I mean, I guess it really depends on the judge. Yeah, but yeah. I would that would be the risk, the gamble I would take. I, so I, I would literally say three of us decided that man's uh, That's fate. what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. there's got to be the people who are there, who are taking it seriously, who are actually looking at the evidence and the story and guiding everybody else. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> um, Sorry, that doesn't give you a warm and fuzzy. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But it's, it's sobering. And I find... Um, I don't know. I guess it's better to know. I don't want to have my head in the sand. Well, and that's kind of the whole point of why I started the podcast was to not sugarcoat yeah. and not, you know, say, oh, well, you know, I really felt this way. No, it was me and two other people. And we found that man guilty and everybody else went along with us. Wow. And I'm not going to even like apologize for it or nothing. It's, that's just the way it went. <laughs> yeah, now, I, I 100% believe in my heart he was guilty. Right. Uh, I, I had no doubts. Uh, and after the trial was over, we went out in the hallway and the defense attorney and the prosecutor said, if you want to ask us any questions, you can ask us. I was like, hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the defense attorney just walked over and said, why did you find him guilty? Okay. And she asked me a question and I said, uh, you didn't have a defense. And she really didn't. Uh, I think the guy could appeal because she put up no defense. Wow. Uh, but I have to decide the verdict based yeah. on the evidence that I'm presented. And right. she didn't present anything to the contrary besides there wasn't any fingerprints there. So how do you know it was him? The prosecutor came over and said, oh, by the way, the other three people that were involved with this yeah. all have already said he did it. <laughs> but we couldn't tell you that during trial because they were facing other charges Oh, and wow. they all pointed to him as the trigger man okay. for reduced sentences in their own, you know, because it was a home invasion. Well, that's good for your confirmation. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> got to feel really good that you don't, you can sleep at night yeah. with the work you did on that jury. Would have been nice to know during trial. I, I would think, I would think. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so the justice system is obviously one that comes up, but I'm always curious too, like, I don't think we're only just talking about murder when we talk about true crime. What do you think we're talking about and and what those themes are that you see surface all the time? I mean, there's other podcasts like Swindled or, or Scandal and yeah. stuff. And, and they no one's dying in those. Right. Uh, you know, and I, I think anything crime related is is definitely true crime. And I uh, same a new case that I'm looking at. I remember uh, the the podcast thinking sideways, they do mysteries, and uh-huh. missing persons and just things like that. And I'm like, well, that's part of it. Oh, for sure. Uh, so I, I'm doing a new case about a guy, I guess he was a, a cryptocurrency exchange in Canada. Okay. And he had half a billion dollars in cryptocurrency locked on his laptop. And he went to India and died. Okay. 
and there were air quotes there <laughs> and he his body was brought back i guess it was buried or something no one can get access to that half billion dollars so all the investors are saying we want his body exhumed <gasps> is this true crime I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. you might have just conned everybody. Totally. I um, I love white collar crime, particularly because I feel there's more room for celebration, which I'll qualify by saying in a murder case, even when the bad guy goes down, you know, it's such a tragedy and there's so much trauma around the victim or survivor that even celebrating feels weird. And also, I don't really particularly celebrate the idea of a man or a woman not... Um, having a chance at redemption or yeah. being rehabilitated, just locked up. Whereas in white collar crime, if somebody swindles someone and they go down for it, like there's just something so that feels so good about that. <laughs> You're like, you have zero. It's like, like us against the man. I don't know. There's just something more freeing that yeah. I feel. And I feel like entertainment and true crime is a fine line. And I think we obviously are entertained because it's storytelling, but you do have to keep all that stuff in check and not just like gleefully be like, yeah, I love this. Yeah. But with those cases I do. Yeah. No, that, that's fine. I guess it's because it's okay because there wasn't anyone murdered yeah. or, or tortured or whatever. And not to say they don't ruin people's lives oh, because absolutely. they do. Yeah. And, but it's a, I don't know, I guess there's just a different kind of freedom. Um, okay. So I only just found out about, the peripheral. Oh. And I don't know why. Because <laughs> I I'm a longtime Generation Y yeah. listener and I just kind of missed it. Yeah. So talk about the moment you're like, I gotta do this other storytelling podcast. Well, as we know in true crime, we have to gloss over things yeah. for sake of storytelling. We have to gloss over things like sexual assault, mental illness, yeah, uh just whatever. Whatever the survivor's story is. We can't go into a 20-minute diatribe about statistics or how to get help. You just have to say, well, this person suffered from mental illness and then move on. Right. And I never liked doing that. So I thought, I'll just start a podcast that talks about all of these subjects that are on the peripheral uh -huh. but should be mainstream topics. Okay. And I just started interviewing people. I just said, hey, if you guys got a story, just write in and I'll interview you. Yeah. And that was it. And what has the response been like to that? It's, it was, uh, it's been amazing. Um, the, uh, people that tell their stories, like it's, I, I will say some of the peripheral episodes are way darker than mm -hmm. any true crime podcast you'll ever listen to, but they're there and they've survived and they're telling their story. So it's, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Dialogue podcast is sponsored in part by She's Birdie. I love She's Birdie. What is She's Birdie? It's a personal alarm that is most importantly easy to use and effective. The alarm is loud and easy to activate when you need to, but impossible to activate accidentally. This is really important. It's also not a hard plastic. It has that kind of silicone, soft, velvety cover around it so it doesn't slip and slide all over the place. It's got a nice grip in your hand. Not as important, but worth mentioning, they're really cute. The founders worked hard to design a product that you don't mind wearing on your handbag or gym bag or car keys. Each one comes with a beautiful brass ring and the alarms themselves come in really fun colors, but also a dark charcoal, which reads as black, which is definitely the one I have. But right now they came out with new spring designs, including blue with little flowers, white with little strawberries, super adorable designs. And if all of that weren't enough, She's Birdie gives back every time you buy one. To date, they've given over $50,000 to local women's shelters and assist in changing legislation to protect victims of abuse and violence. Don't wait. Prepare yourself and the people you love with a She's Birdie personal alarm now. Dialogue listeners get 10% off when they use the code DIEHARD. Go to She'sBirdie.com and use the code DIEHARD, D-I-E-H-A-R-D, for 10% off at checkout. That 10% applies even on top of a sale. There's just no reason not to have a She's Birdie. Again, it's She'sBirdie.com, code DIEHARD. Hey listeners, I want to tell you something that you might not know about me. I like reality TV. I might even say I love it. 
Not as much as true crime, but a lot. And I want to tell you about a podcast that I think you might like if you too sometimes want to escape into reality television. It's produced by People Magazine, and it's called People Every Day. It's hosted by their editor, Janine Rubenstein, and it's just a great fun mix of popular celebrity culture and also some human interest stories mixed in with interviews, feature stories, and entertainment news. You're going to find episodes about unpacking Britney Spears conservatorship, which, hi, we've done here on Dialogue, culture scandals. I mean, you can't have a culture without cult, so already interested. And exclusive interviews with A-listers like Julianne Moore, The Rock, Chelsea Clinton, and many more. People Every Day is your daily dose of pop culture and what makes us human. You can listen to People Every Day wherever you get podcasts. Yeah, no, to me, that's what I think of when I think about what are we talking about when we talk about true crime. I think about we're talking about mental illness, addiction, sexual assault, trauma, all these things that are usually embedded somewhere in the case. Yeah. And they rise to the surface. And I, I feel like, again, true crime gives us this way to talk about them. But I understand what you're saying. That's sometimes not always in the format of the case podcast. Um, but I love that you have this other platform where you can unpack them a little more slowly and give them the air. Yeah. And, they and this deserve. is and this is me talking to somebody that suffered. Yeah. It's not me talking to a, a therapist. Or an expert, right. Yeah, right. where it always seems to get watered down and saturated or, you know, just sanitized, really. Yeah. Uh, you're getting a very raw story. Well, there's that healthy distance with an expert um, that sometimes isn't the gut punch you need to understand and to kind of build empathy. I listened to the one on addiction, yeah. um, or not addiction, uh, mental illness with your guest, Tiffany. Yeah, yeah. That was a really good example of someone who has the language that you only have if you suffered. Yeah. You know, so it was really interesting. Um, okay, so something that's come up as well with my guests is being a critic and consumer of true crime. Can you be both? What would you consider yourself? I'm definitely both. Okay. Uh, Can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, obviously I'm a consumer of it because I watch forensic files. I listen to podcasts. I'm very interested in the genre. Uh, I do struggle with the comedy ones. Um, Say more. I just because when we started out, I might talk about the audacity of some, you know, criminal or what a prosecutor did and sort of chuckle about it. Yeah. And I would get hate mail saying, this isn't funny. You're talking about murder. You need to check yourself, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yet the biggest true crime podcasts out there are the comedy ones. And you can say, oh, well, they don't victim blame or they don't make fun of this or they don't do that. But it's all in the context. Yeah. So I think if I was a surviving family member of somebody who was murdered, would I really want that story told Right. In the middle of somebody talking about, you know, <laughs> whatever joke they're throwing out yeah. while eating donuts and, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's tough because, you know, I'm wondering if it's, do you think something happened to the audience over the years? I just wonder if for some people it's the more palatable way to engage with the story and the subject. I mean, and I'm, I laugh at all the inappropriate things. And I, yeah. I definitely have a nervous laughter of when things are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I know That's that. That's the worst. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, I guess it's just our us distancing ourselves and trying to bring some light to it. Yeah. So on the same time, I absolutely understand why people make fun you know, or have fun with the true crime genre. Yeah. Because you do have to lighten it up. But at the same time, as somebody who has been a survivor of terrible things. Yeah. I don't know if I'd want my story told that way. Yeah, it's subjective. And I think uh, you will meet people who, who would say what you're saying and, and come out and be like, I'm actually okay with that. And that's why it is nice to have a diverse landscape of options for people yeah. to listen to. There's room for everybody. There is room for everybody. And that is something too. Since 2012, this population has grown in terms of consumption and creators. Yeah. So what are some of the changes the other changes you're seeing there's there's comedy podcasts now in addition in the true crime genre uh what else do you see changing within true crime uh, it's becoming more produced now and it's hard to 
just start up and jump in and make a splash uh, because it's just so saturated. So crowded. I liken it to, I remember when there used to be cable access TV uh-huh. network, like Wayne's World, you know, people just recording themselves yes. in the basement doing something stupid and yeah. it, everyone would get to see it. Well, podcasting is still in its infancy because you still have independent podcasters that can go out and do whatever they want. But as far as the true crime genre goes, the networks are swooping in and you're starting to see that transition from anything goes where it's a punk rock world where indie anything Uh goes to now it's going to be very polished and produced and it's going to be taken over. And it's sad when that happens, when it's gentrified. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You lose, maybe you lose something, something might be gained too. Like maybe the standards go up. Definitely. And it weeds out some, maybe some nonsense that we didn't need. (laughs) But yeah, on the other hand, is there some artistic kind of loss? Yeah. I mean, if I started the Generation Y today, I absolutely believe I would not be as successful. Interesting. Well, it's cool now because you guys get to be the pioneers and the OGs. Yeah. But what, what, (laughs) what makes me stand out now? Two friends talking about true crime. Everyone's doing that now. (laughs) Right. And the only thing you get to say is, well, I was doing it in 2012. So, (laughs) and in 2012, when we started, we had people writing and going, you're not authors. You're not cops. You're not investigators. What gives you the right to talk about this? Isn't that interesting? And now it's, oh yeah. You just, now it's like, who wants to hear an expert? I yeah. want to hear two besties <laughs> exactly. doing it over drinks. <laughs> the times have um, changed. Yeah. The times really have changed. I always want to know from my guests, like what is that first case you remember grabbing your attention that kind of never left you? I was a small child living in California. Hard to picture. I know. I know. <laughs> Most people just think I came out this way. But uh, and I remember looking at the TV. And it was probably black and white TV. I don't know. I'm dating myself right now. But uh, I remember seeing Richard Ramirez's face Oof. on the TV because it was the tail end. Like either they had just caught him uh-huh. because I don't remember the exact time frame. But I was alive and watching TV when that was happening. And that was the first thing that I remember. Uh, later on, when I met Aaron, both of us were into really dark goth industrial music. And in industrial music, they sample things. Okay. So Aaron and I started making music together. And we would sample quotes from serial killers or quotes from law enforcement chasing us, ser- like to make it dark and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, the original intro song to the Generation Y that you can hear on like the first hundred episodes was the first song Aaron and I made together back in like 1995. Oh, very cool. Uh, and then uh, a guy named uh, uh, Andy DiBiase, I hope I say his name right, <laughs> uh, he redid it. And he just took our original format and re- Into the current one? Yes. Oh, That's what you hear now. Wow. Is a, a, I have a, to go back and compare. A remake of Aaron and I's original track, which was essentially based on our love of true crime and murder and serial killers <laughs> very haunting if like that image from i mean richard ramirez like stuff of nightmares even just yeah. the visual that would stay with you i could see that yeah. um are there any cases you feel you didn't get wrong but if you went back you might have a different stance that you covered yeah uh and, and luckily for us since we've been around since 2012 we've actually pulled a few of our old episodes and then redid them nice <laughs> with our cuz like the staircase our original version in episode 2 we tossed it and we have a two parter now where we give our full thoughts on I think it. I've heard that one I don't yeah. yeah I probably missed two don't worry about it. Because, <laughs> can't wait for the day you can be like, let's pretend that never happened. <laughs> you know, I, I, most podcasters are like, yeah, your first episode is always the worst. And then you, you know, you're always embarrassed by it. And yeah. I can say, you know, probably our first 40 episodes. <laughs> I can like. Ah. It gives me hope. It gives yeah. me hope. So what, what changed? Was it just how you covered it that you didn't feel you needed to keep it out there? Or were you like, mm, we got this wrong? I, I felt like we were giving him way more benefit of the doubt. Okay. Uh, Michael Peterson, that is. Yeah. No, uh, and, uh, the only he. Yeah. And I think that he absolutely murdered her. Yeah. Uh, and rewatching the documentary, I, I just kind of came to the conclusion that she didn't fall down the stairs. No way, no day. And he didn't hit her with a poker or he, and he didn't throw her down the stairs. He stomped on her head. And that's why 
she had no fractures in her skull, but her her flesh was torn yeah. apart because yeah. if you're stomping on somebody's head and it's kind of glancing off. You can tear their, their you know skin off. Uh, and then he took his bloody shoes off and then went to the kitchen. So, and no one has that theory. I'm like, well, it's so obvious. He mm-hmm. just stomped on her. And I guess it's from my old punk punk rock lifestyle. <laughs> you know, I see people getting stomped in the street. I'm like, that's what happened. And it's so wow. obvious to me. Okay. And no one's really put that together. They think no. he, the fireplace poker. They'd rather bring a bird into yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and hey, I love the bird idea. Me too. It's I, fun. I'm, st- I'm still like 90% he stomped her to death. 10% owl. maybe the bird did it. <laughs> the owl. I love it. I have a... um. So in addition to dialogue, I do this true crime trivia show in New York. And I have a category called Peterson, Peterson, Peterson. Yeah. And all the questions are about... Uh, Peterson, the answer is just which one, Drew, Scott, or Michael. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And this is where that fine line of comedy and true crime come in. Like, that's a funny concept that we have all these, like, murderous yeah. white dudes with the last name Peterson. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's not funny. Obviously, those yeah. cases and those stories are beyond tragic. It's, it's just it's just coincidental, and that's it, ironic. It's just like, I can't help. Yeah. I didn't write it. It's just I see it, and I see this this moment of levity that you can have. So I guess that's where that tension is for me, where I understand both sides. We had uh, family members uh, in the Scott Peterson case reach out to us after we covered that. Okay. Family members from Lacey's side. Uh, Sister-in-law? Yeah. Perhaps? Yeah, I've seen her speak. Yeah, she's totally believes he's innocent. Yeah, she's an advocate for sure. it's, It's surprising because I think the... It's all circumstantial. It's but, all circumstantial. But it's like, man, like, who, how would this have gone down? But, you know. But yeah. that's, that's a great example of a case with no DNA. Um, but there's no eyewitness the way there was in the case where you served on a jury. Yeah. But um, it's, to me, the most plausible explanation, which is simple. usually yeah. Yeah. the one. So I feel pretty confident about that one. But I know people now are bringing that one back up and saying, I wouldn't have convicted. There is reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. And I suppose there is with no eyewitness and no DNA. Um, Is there a cold case that haunts you that you really want the answer to more than any other? I don't want to be cliche and say the Adnan case. uh, But I don't find that cliche. Yeah, I I just that's the one where I think it just comes down to do you believe Jay or not? Yeah. And if you believe Jay, then he did it. If you don't believe Jay, then he didn't do it. You think it's that simple? I I do. I truly do think it's it comes down to Jay's confession. Do you believe it? He changed his story so much that I can't give that man credit. So I won't say I'm a huge Adnan supporter, but I'm like, dude, this guy's statements are just all over the place. And when it comes to other cases where witness testimony or what have you is, you know, if, if somebody comes in and they're like, okay, where were you at the time of your wife's murder? And they're like, oh, I was at the bingo hall. And then later on, they're like, oh, I was actually at home. Oh, yeah. I was actually, you're like, you look guilty as hell. Yeah, <laughs> and, for and, sure. And you don't think that their statements have any credibility. And when you look at Jay's statements, it's like, if you apply that same logic, it doesn't pan out. How would there be any knowledge of any of it, Hay's body, the trunk, the car, if it was completely and utterly disconnected from him and or Adnan? That's my question. I've seen it in other cases. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's, it's what Rabia uh, puts in her book. It's, it's, Which I just started. Yeah, it's coaching. It's okay. them, the investigators, and I, I'm not trying to say all cops do this because most do not, but... They know all the, the hits. They know all the evidence. They know everything. And they'll write it all down on a statement. And guide. And just guide you. The person of interest and, towards it. And most of the time, that interrogation practice is, we're helping you remember. Right. Sure. You're sure, struggling sure. Let us support it. the yeah. foggy memories you But it's have. very leading. Is there any... Sometimes I wonder, do you think it's possible, the reason for the inconsistencies, could Jay be talking about... Adnan in his statements, but it's actually him. Absolutely. And that's where the like disruption comes in. Yeah, but which then, could implicate Adnan, but in a different way. Yeah. But but the hard thing about it is is what would Jay's motive be? If I know. He doesn't have one. Right. Oh, I Besides, know. Besides he's a teenager who might be impulsive and crazy. Right. <laughs> right. Which, which we've also seen. Yeah. 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 
So that's that's the one case where I I really don't know. Same. Um, I I have my opinions about Stephen Avery. I have my opinions about a lot of the other top notch cases, but the Adnan case, I I will not die on the hill arguing that one one way or another. I feel the same way. That's actually my own answer to that question. Can I hear the Stephen Avery thoughts? I, I mean, in a nutshell, I absolutely think he did it. Uh, <laughs> and when I watch the making the murder making of a murderer documentaries, they're done so well so well I, I love those documentaries they're they're just magnificent they're works of art and i shred them as far as the evidence that they say is tainted or whatever uh the second season especially and i'm a huge fan of kathleen zellner uh-huh. uh, but i felt that all of her arguments in that second season were very weak and just her tests that she was doing like the the blood smear on the dashboard yeah I'm like, like, oh, well, he didn't have to turn the key and smear the blood on the dashboard. I'm like, but it's Stephen Avery. Like, he's not going to be totally careful. Like, he's playing the game of operation, right. and not not right. spread blood around. I'm like this. Yeah. And, and that's, I guess, what Stephen Avery and any of these cases, the prosecution's theory or how it played out is usually not correct. But just because they get it wrong doesn't mean the guy didn't do it. And first season of Making a Murder, it was the cops planted everything. Second season is his brother did it. And, yeah. You know, and right. Bobby. And, or, yeah. And so at that point, I'm like, well, yeah, it had to have been somebody on the property that did it. But why would it be his brother and not Stephen when Brendan Dassey had already said to his mother on the phone when she asked, did you do this? And he said some of it. Yeah. But not all of it. And the circumstances around Brendan? I'm, I feel for that guy. I, do you I, think he should be released? I think he should at least probably be given a retrial. Yeah. Uh, because there's, there's a lot of... Uh, he has a lot of setbacks in his life that mm-hmm. I thought were definite mitigating circumstances. Yeah, yeah, and, that's well said. And, and the inconsistencies of our legal system where he admitted to raping and murdering Teresa Halbach, so therefore he is found guilty of those things. Whereas Stephen Avery did not admit guilt. And since her body had been burned and there was no proof that you could say she was sexually assaulted, they couldn't charge him with that. But they could charge Brendan with that. It's like, what? Yeah, (laughs) quite add up. Yeah, 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 I feel for him too. I also think Stephen Avery did it. I'm feeling emboldened by your um, hard stance. I'm naturally more of a diplomat and I, I, but it's, it's kind of feels good sometimes to just say how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't cover cases on my show either. I interview people and hear their perspectives around true crime. So I'm also not being asked to say that very often, but sometimes it just feels good to kind of say what you think. Yeah. Yeah. And let people. Yeah. People get mad, you know, but I, 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 but again, my opinion on Stephen Avery's guilt or innocence has no bearing. Right. And you know, Kathleen's going to do what Kathleen's going to do. Well, that's course. for damn sure. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody <Yeah>. telling her <laughs> yeah. what is what. So you've got Generation Y, the peripheral. Where do you see the podcast going? And do you have any kind of new endeavors in your mind as you see the landscape change? Do you have other medias, media um, mediums you want to pursue? Or what are you thinking? I actually just did another podcast called Deadly Misadventures. Ooh. And it's all about people just surviving crazy accidents or... You know, it's kind of like that show, I Shouldn't Be Alive, essentially. Yeah, did you talk about it on the Parachuter episode of yeah, Generation yeah, Y? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So That's a crazy one. That is a completely different gear I, I had to go into because Aaron and I just talk casually. I interview people. I talk yeah. casually. I was being a voice actor reading a script oh. on Deadly Misadventures, and that's not something I've ever really done before. So it was very new to me. And That's uh, cool. And I definitely am looking for just side projects and stuff. And I guess that's how I'm keeping things fresh. Yeah, I would imagine you have to kind of shake it up and do something different every now and then. Yeah. And were you inspired last night by the new forensic file voiceover actor? Well, yeah, and that's why I asked the question. Yeah, I'm thinking about it now. (laughs) It was great. You know, I was one of the only people that asked the question. I was like, how'd you find that tone? And I wanted to ask him more questions afterwards, but I didn't want to be that guy. I hate being that guy and girl, (laughs) but but I'm endlessly curious, so I do also want to be. It's very hard. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask last night, and I didn't because I didn't think it was appropriate, but I would like to talk about they use the term prostitute in the episode 
And it kind of was jarring to me because I'm like, oh, I thought we all knew it's a sex worker now. Yeah. You know, it's 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 a hard one because it is definitely more of uh, the social standard now. Yeah. The term sex worker. But sex worker is such an, an umbrella term. I know. Where an exotic dancer to a cam girl to whatever can all be considered a sex worker. So as much as I don't care for the term prostitute, sometimes it's just so much easier to just get to the point. Because it's it's more defined. It's less yeah. gray. Yeah. So and I, I wondered, I was talking to Stephen Pacheco about it, and he, I wondered, uh, he meant, what did he say? I wonder if legally they had to say that because of the definition, and it's probably run through some things. But um, I just, I hadn't heard it in a while because I think podcasters are careful not to use it, or at yeah. least currently that's the sort of And, and the whole preferred. stigma about it is uh, prostitute has that connotation of you're doing something illegal. Right. And that, Criminal. Yeah, something criminal and I guess in the in the scheme of things, if it's against the law in that state, they're technically not wrong using the term, and I'm not defending or endorsing sure, it. Sure. I'm just saying what law enforcement and what the TV shows are going to do is this is the term, and yeah. they're using it appropriately in that context. But I agree yeah. that makes sense. I just it stood out to me. Oh, it, to it, my ears. I, I absolutely my podcast ears. <laughs> like like sat up and was like, oh, okay, yeah. you know, yeah, and and I don't get. I don't get upset by it. I, I actually had a, uh, a sex worker on the peripheral okay. who, and okay. I asked him that question. I said, why is the term prostitute, you know, bad? Problematic. And, and he went on for 15 minutes giving his description about it. Okay. So, and I, I agreed with his logic. Yeah. I did. But it doesn't mean that I can't look at a show like Forensic Files and, and you know, totally. Accept it in yeah, context. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. Justin, something I ask all my guests before they go is, "What is keeping you up at night?" This is the this is the question that I had to think most on. Okay. And I used to, you know, I used to let haters and idiots on the internet keep me up at night, and I don't do that anymore. Good. But I, I've kind of had some self reflection lately, and this is going to sound weird, but anything I've ever put my mind to, set my heart to, or had intentions for, has been an utter failure. And anything that I've... Just, I was not expecting that. Sorry. <laughs> and anything that I've just kind of lackadaisically just half-assed has been a huge success. Huh. Or has just landed in my lap. And I'm trying to reconcile that now in my life of, do I go after another project or do I just network and wait for that project to fall in my lap? Interesting. <laughs> that is a really good thing to note and to identify. Yeah. I mean, here's some weird examples if you're like trying to understand. Like in high school, every girl I asked out said no. Okay. Yet I've been married for 15 years. Right. You know, I applied for a marijuana dispensary in Missouri. Okay. Uh, spent all this time, dropped all this money, was denied. Wait, what's a ma- marijuana dispensary? It's, it's a generic. medical marijuana. Okay. Yeah, medical cannabis dispensary. Okay. I dedicated months of my life and a lot of time and money, got denied. Huh. Generation Y was just me calling up there and saying, hey, man, let's just start this podcast Almost going. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how my life has been. And I'm starting to realize I think that. lean into that. <laughs> exactly. I have three kids and I think my third one is like that. He's the kid that walks down the New York City streets and puts his um, hand in every parking meter and he pulls out, not quarters, dollars. Yeah. Like, he's got the golden thing that, I don't know, I'm not applying that to you, I'm not saying you're like no. a golden child, but like things find him. He attracts that and... I have a lot of luck. Yeah. And so sometimes I think I, I might cause myself undue stress by trying too hard on things. Right. And so much of the the conversation now is around like, you know, being intentional and hustling and all of that and putting it all in there. But maybe maybe your mojo trifecto is different. Yeah. You have to put yourself out there to yeah. get gain opportunity. Yeah. You have to be present. Yeah. Um, and then I think opportunities can find you. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm excited to see what's next. And thank you so much for doing this on your trip to New York. <laughs> no problem. It was my it. pleasure. Dialogue is a Yellow Tape Media production, audio engineered by Jason Usry and produced 
hosted and edited by me, Rebecca Sebastian. If you love the podcast, please consider becoming a diehard by signing up at patreon.com slash dialogue. Other ways to support the show, follow along on social media. We are at Dialogue Pod across platforms, and you can now watch most episodes on YouTube by subscribing to my channel, Rebecca Sebastian. For more information or to drop me a note, visit RebeccaSebastian.com. Until next time, thank you for listening and killing the small talk.